this week on Vaticano, Pope Francis creates five new cardinals representing the far reaches of the earth. Catch our exclusive interview with the first Swedish cardinal since the Reformation. And stay with us to honor the memory of the press spokesman of Pope St. John Paul II. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. In today's Gospel, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord does not reserve this phrase for some of his friends, no. He addresses to all those that are tired and oppressed by life. With these words, Pope Francis started his catechesis before the Angelus prayer on Sunday, July the 9th. He said that Jesus wants to help us with our worries, problems and wounds. However, it's up to us to take the first step toward him. Seek Jesus. Go to a missionary of mercy. Go to a priest. Go. But go to Jesus and tell this to Jesus. Today, he says to each one of us, Hold on. Do not give in to the burdens of life. Do not close yourself in face of fears and sins, but come to me. The Holy Father said that Jesus is not going to magically resolve our problems, but will make us strong. He's not going to lift weights from our lives, but will free us from anguish. He's not going to take away our crosses, but will carry them with us. When Jesus enters our life, peace comes, that peace which remains even in trials and in sufferings. Let us go to Jesus then. On the morning of June the 29th, Cardinal George Pell told journalists in Rome that he would be going to Australia to face charges against him for alleged sexual abuse and negligence in handling cases of sexual abuse. On June the 28th, the Australian police announced they were bringing charges against the now head of the Vatican Finance Department. The Cardinal said he had received the Holy Father's permission to go to Australia to clear his name. I'm looking forward, finally, to having my day in court. Uh, I'm innocent of these charges. They are false. The whole idea of sexual abuse is abhorrent to me. Cardinal George Pell has fought these allegations for several years from Rome. He will finally appear before the Melbourne Magistrates Court on July the 18th to face the charges and to have his say on the matter. At the end of June, during an ordinary public consistory, Pope Francis created five new cardinals. These five new cardinals are Jean Zerbo from Mali, Africa, Juan José Omeya from Spain, Luis Marie Ling Manganacun from Laos, Gregorio Rosa Chavez from El Salvador, and Anders Arborelius from Sweden. After the celebration in St. Peter's Basilica, the newly created cardinals paid a visit to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. The duties of the College of Cardinals include advising the Pope and helping him govern the Church. They're also responsible for the election of each new Bishop of Rome. Every cardinal under the age of 80 can vote for a new Pope. During the most recent consistory on June the 28th, Pope Francis appointed five new cardinals. Four of them are the first ever from their respective countries, Mali, El Salvador, Sweden, and Laos. The first public appearance of the newly appointed cardinals happened right after the consistory. Family members, friends, journalists, and brothers in the priesthood all gathered in the Paul VI audience hall to meet these new close collaborators of the Pope. It's a great blessing and uh, Holy Father once again has chosen 
people from different parts of the world to show the Catholicity of the church and to enrich the Cardinal, the College of Cardinals with people with, from different cultures and uh, it's uh, very exciting. The circumstances under which the Catholic communities live in different areas may vary, of course, depending on the country. For instance, the elevation of Mali's Archbishop Zerbo shows attention and support to the peace and reconciliation work of the church in his country. Differently from Cardinal Zerbo, Archbishop Juan José Omeya inherited the traditional cardinal at sea in Barcelona. Cardinal Omeya says that he will follow in the footsteps of his predecessors in the work of evangelization and service to the poor. Barcelona is a cosmopolitan city where people from all over the world go. You only have to be in the square right in front of the cathedral to see this. You can hear all the languages and all races and all cultures pass here. Or go to the Sagrada Familia and you'll see a lot of different people who go there every day. The church in Laos, where there are about 45,000 Catholics and only 33 priests, is very different from the more traditional Catholic Barcelona. Yes, but you know, Oh, we are in the, um, we are minor, you know, as a Catholic. But, you know, we understand each other always. You are a cardinal or not, you are the same. Yeah, but to be simple and to be really with the people. Laos is a unitary Marxist-Leninist one-party socialist republic that doesn't have diplomatic ties with the Holy See. I think Francis, he really understand what we are living, the situation and the problems and resolution and so on. I think he understand it. He stand, he stand very much, yes. Cardinal Luis Marie Ling spent about three years from 1984 to 1987 in a communist prison. It's hard to imagine that during those three years, Bishop Ling ever thought that one day he would become a cardinal. The Salvadoran Cardinal Chavez has some things in common with the Laotian Luis Marie Ling. Both of them know what it's like to serve God under an atheistic regime. It came as a complete surprise. The Pope had a good reason for doing this. I'd like to thank the Holy Father for his trust. We have a lot of hard work to do. I hope that God will help us, and above all, Monsignor Romero too so we can be ready for a very important mission, for a big moment in my life, thanks to the election of Pope Francis. Bishop Chavez is not only the first Salvadorian cardinal, but he's also the first auxiliary bishop to become a cardinal. He's also well known for his close collaboration with blessed Oscar Romero, who was martyred in 1980. The other surprising nomination of this consistory was the appointment of Bishop Anders Arborelius, the first Swedish-born bishop since the Reformation. To discover more about him, stay tuned and watch the next story on Vaticano. Thanks for watching. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Now on Vaticano, an exclusive interview by Edward Penton with the Archbishop of Stockholm, Sweden, the day before becoming a cardinal. Your Excellency, welcome to the program, first of all. And you're the first uh, Swedish bishop to have been made a cardinal. Uh, you also uh, have a very interesting background in that you're the first ethnic Swede, I think, to be made a bishop since the Reformation. Could you briefly tell us your story and perhaps uh, beginning with your conversion to the Catholic Church? Well, it has a lot to do with the house where we are, because my first Catholic contact was with the Sister of St. Bridget in Switzerland. I was born in Switzerland by Swedish parents, a Protestant or a non-practicing family. But already in my uh, childhood and youth, I had contact with Catholics, especially with those sisters. And then gradually, during my youth, I entered more and more into the Catholic faith. So when I finished high school, I started a course for converts. And at the age of 20, I was received into the Catholic Church. Mm. Just before we go on to uh, the reasons why you've become a cardinal, could you just tell us briefly what drew you to the Catholic Church? What, what uh, brought you? Well, the first was the personal witness. I met persons who lived the gospel, who could show Christ's love, who really 
showed us what it is to be a Christian. I think that's very meaningful. And then gradually I had to enter into studying the doctrine and everything somehow spoke to my heart. There was nothing special, but I felt this is all what God means for us. It's the truth. So it was a very simple uh, growth into the church. Now, a lot's been said about why the Holy Father has chosen you to become a cardinal. What do, what do you think your re the reasons are for you that the Pope has for elevating you to the College of Cardinals? Well, it's a question that many people have put to me. I cannot read his thoughts and heart. But if we look upon uh, Pope Francis, we see that he goes to the poor, to those far away, to those who are a bit forgotten in the marginal. And the Catholic Church is really a peripheral reality in the Catholic Church. We feel that he has uh, really looked for forgotten parts of the world as Mali, Laos and Sweden, because in various ways we are very marginalized in the Catholic world. Now, of course, you're having to struggle a lot with this long-standing challenge in Sweden of secularism and secularist ideology. Um, I believe the highest abortion rate in Europe is in Sweden, or it used, used to be until fairly recently. And even recently, you've had cases of a midwife who, who has to perform an abortion. She can't uh, claim uh, discrimination. So what to you are the most disturbing developments in Sweden in this, in this area? And what, what is the church doing about it and trying to... Well, the church can offer an alternative. And I think uh, that's become more and more evident that people feel emptiness, they feel that somehow is missing. And that's what we see that the Catholic Church, even if people do not accept everything we say, they look upon it as a kind of alternative. And more and more people also in the media become Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to see that uh, even if we are a small, humble minority and we don't have the possibility to proclaim the faith all over the society, but at the same time there is a growing interest in Catholic doctrine, Catholic spirituality, Catholic ethical outlook. But is it a concern of yours, this, this situation that seems to be developing around the world? Regardless of well, of course, system. it's always uh, difficulty when there are different points of view upon these issues. And I would say that the main concern is that marriage has become so weak, also in Catholic countries. And I know that some bishops say that, unfortunately, many young Catholics who marry do not understand what they do. And I think that's also the main concern of Morris, that it's to have a better preparation because we live in a world where, well, the media, it's totally different. Mm. The Catholic vision of marriage is totally different that so many young people have no idea about what they do when they marry. And that's a pastoral concern of... And, and many years of poor catechesis. Yes, and uh, we see that when people come to Sweden as Catholics. And it has to do with the vision on marriage, sexuality, and all these issues, because the society mm. offers a totally different vision. Mm. Moving on to Lund and ecumenism, that was obviously a very big event last October that the Holy Father came to. Mm. It's also a controversial one. Um, people call it the celebration of Luther or the document from Conflict to Communion. Some say painted Luther as a religious hero. Um, who led the way to a more true form of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. These were kind of the f some of the frictions ahead of it. But I'm just wondering, have you seen any positive fruits from that visit, from that time? Well, I have seen that it's been easier for Catholics and Lutherans to meet. For instance, young people, and they have, for instance, in Lund regularly a Vesper, or in the, either in the Lutheran Cathedral or the Catholic parish. It has had an impact also on society because in the media, uh, we Christians are always described as always quarreling, discussing, having conflicts internally. And we have tried to show that we have uh, the main thing in common, the gospel. And we try to work from that standpoint. 
What's the limit, do you think? How far could relations go before you say, enough, we can't get any closer, the differences are too great? What's, <laughs> what's the limit there? Well, it's very difficult to say. I would say the other way around, that when we come closer, it also becomes more painful that there are divisions. For instance, the question of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Many Lutherans say, why cannot we come to intercommunion now? Mm -hmm. And then we have to say no. There are still very different things that we have to discuss about the Eucharist, about the ministry and so forth. You want to celebrate Luther, but you're also willing to invite the Pope, who really was, at the time of the Reformation, the source of conflict. So it's a sign that you in some way accept the Holy Father as a symbol or a prophetic figure on the way to unity. And just lastly, your, once you're Cardinal, what, is, what are going to be your plans, your, your hopes for the future as Cardinal? Do you have any programme to do? Or is it just well, kind of... I always say I don't know what it will imply. I don't know if I will be asked to have some kind of task in some congregation in Rome or some... Mm. Uh, I have to wait and see what the Holy Father asks of me. But what I see, for instance, in Sweden, there will be a more official uh, situation for me because as cardinal people are more interested to hear about our faith, our church. So I will see. I am sure that there will be much more to do in Sweden. So I'm a bit afraid if they want more in Rome, I will have no time for Because I think this is a providential moment for the Catholic Church in Sweden. Last year we had a canonization we had the visit of the Pope and now a Cardinal. Mm. So it's a unique uh, moment in our Catholic history of Sweden. Mm. We never know about the future, but for the moment, uh, people are interested in us. People seem to have more sympathy. They have more openness for the faith. Mm. And then we have to be, more evan be better to evangelize Sweden. Well, Your Excellency, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And thank you for your interest in our humble little reality of Catholic Church in Sweden. You're welcome. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. thank you. In a few moments, we'll bring you a report from the Holy See Mission to the United Nations in Geneva. More on Vaticano begins now. This movie tells the story of U.S. Army Corporal Desmond Dost in 1942, the first conscientious objector. Oh, sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. Private Dost, you are free to run into the hellfire of battle without a single weapon to protect yourself. While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. He also was the first one to receive the Medal of Honor during World War II. After the war, the proclamation of the right to conscience was ratified in 1948 by the United Nations General Assembly in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Professor Heiner Bielefeld, the former UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Religion or Belief, said that the right to conscientious objection to military service is necessary and an indispensable partner to the freedom of religion. He later included medical staff who refused to perform abortions. When it comes to conscientious objection, it's so important to protect those doctors and nurses who bear witness to the truth, and the truth is that the unborn uh, child is a member of the human family and deserves protection from its earliest stages. To raise public awareness about the right to conscience and religion and the exercises of conscientious objection, this side event was held at the UN Geneva in late June. In recent years, though, this right has been unjustifiably limited, as only applying to military service and even extended in favor of radically new and unfounded interpretations of human rights. As in Spain, France, Germany, United Kingdom, parents will have not the right to take away their children from school during sexual vagonies class, where children will learn that mother and father are unnatural, while lesbian and transgender represent the future, the future of human evolution. Freedom of conscience will disappear. That's what we are now up to. 
uh, because if you look at uh, what's happening not only here at the UN, but what's happening in the field, then you, you see that uh, uh, the, the Geneva Conventions, I must say International Humanitarian Law, the Genocide Convention uh, and fundamental human rights are being now attacked. Are there special interest groups within the UN system that want to alter this right to suit their agenda? It's a, it's a reality. You, you can see, in, see this in, in uh, UN document, documents. For instance, the gender-based violence is something that is new, that was not uh, promoted uh, 30 years ago. Freedom of conscience is distinct but interrelated with religious freedom, and neither can fully exist without the other. It is a fundamental universal right that guarantees the functioning and survival of an open and free civilization. Looking from the point of view of personal convictions, nothing can be mainstreamed. And mainstreaming would be the worst thing you can do. The more, even you know, in a personal development, you, you are happy because you are different. No? People of faith, as well as people with moral compasses, motivated by other ethical considerations, must have freedom of conscience in order to be able to fully live out their convictions, beliefs and values. I think also uh, living, um, how to say, happily our convictions. No? This is typically uh, uh, ch church uh, strong uh, side of the church or religious organization. So we have to show and we have to bring and we have to show to the others the positive side of our human experience, which is also religious experience, the spiritual experience. And I think this is why these events as today is so important to have it also in the context of many other events, which are probably very much different than this. Thank you very much, Paul. Joaquin Navarro Valls, Pope St. John Paul II's spokesman, has died at the age of 80. Mr. Navarro Valls had been diagnosed with terminal cancer some weeks before his death on July the 6th. He passed away at his home after being discharged from the hospital. Navarro Valls was a close friend of John Paul II. He accompanied the pontiff on most of his 104 international trips. Through his professional medical eye, he also shared the Pope's illness and the extremely difficult task of announcing the death of his friend John Paul II to the world fell upon him. It was April the 3rd, 2005. Let's hear about this moment from his own lips. It was on a Friday morning, and John Paul II would die the following day in the afternoon, naturally, in his room, with serenity. That morning, Cardinal Ratzinger came in to say goodbye to him. He knelt beside the bed where John Paul II would die. He took his hand, he kissed it, and I remember almost every word that Cardinal Ratzinger said. I want to thank you, Holy Father, for all that I've learned from you during these years. Navarro Valls was born in Cartagena, Spain in 1936. He obtained degrees in medicine, journalism and communications. He joined Opus Dei and moved to Rome in 1970, where he was a correspondent for the Spanish newspaper ABC. In 1984, St. John Paul II appointed him as the director of the Vatican Press Office. Navarro Valls kept this office for almost 20 years until his retirement under Pope Benedict XVI in 2005. Mario Biasetti has worked as a journalist under the last five popes. He was a colleague of Navarro Valls for many years. My relationship with Joaquin was on a personal basis, also because I was a little bit older than him, <laughs> like 11 years, and uh, so I had no problems. And uh, you know, with him, it, I was always Mario, and to me, he was always Joaquin. 
For two decades, Navarro Valls made a huge effort to modernize the communications of the Vatican. What I saw during the, the Navarro years is that things became a lot easier, a lot easier to work because I, I can tell you that at one time talking to an American cardinal, you know, uh, uh, I told him that it was so difficult to work in the Vatican. I said, you know, it's easier working in the Kremlin than it is in the Vatican. <laughs> Thanks to his excellent work and his commitment to the doctrine of the church, Joaquin Navarro Valls opened the door for many lay people to work at the Vatican. He was a journalist, yes, but also, you know, he was a churchman. We knew that and we appreciated it. He made sure that always what he did, what he said, was in conjunction with the doctrine of the faith. Navarro Valls' funeral was held July the 7th at the Basilica of Santo Genio in Rome. The Vicar General of Opus Dei, Bishop Mariano Fazio, presided over the ceremony. Join us next week on Vaticano and learn more about the diplomatic efforts of the Catholic Church in South Korea for the reconciliation with its northern neighbor. Thanks for watching.